Welcome to Waltrip Unfiltered. It's my podcast. I appreciate you tuning in to listen to our guest today. Our guest is Buffy Hawthorne, the former Mrs. Michael Waltrip. She's um, going to talk about the documentary. Buffy was in the documentary, and the documentary is going to come out uh, in theaters across America on September 12th. You can go blinkofaneyefilm.com and buy your tickets. There's a button on there you push to get your tickets, and then you pick your seat, and um, you'll be all set to watch the doc. I have so much passion and heart for this project. The The documentary turned out so well, and um, I'm appreciative of, of Buffy and, and Dale Jr. and my brother Daryl, Richard Petty, Richard Childress. There's just a lot of the NASCAR community that participated in it and um, we sh we showed the documentary to, to the NASCAR industry back a month or so ago and people seem to, to really enjoy it and I know you will as well and especially after hearing Buffy uh, tell about some of the stories of, of those times so really appreciate her joining us here at our Fox Sports Studios. We're located in Charlotte, North Carolina and um, we'll have a good time bringing you these guests. Last week, we had LaTarte. He was a fun storyteller to listen to. Um, a guy that won the Xfinity race Friday night in Bristol, Tyler Reddick. He's been on the show before. Noah Grex and Christopher Bell, Joey Logano, Denny Hamlin. All these episodes are available. Uh, and, and what I love most about the podcast is I get the opportunity to set across the table from guys that maybe I, maybe I play golf with. Heck, maybe I even went to have a beer or two with them. But you really never know the story. And, and when I signed up to do a podcast, I didn't see that one coming. I thought we would just be entertaining the fans and, and enjoying uh, sh sharing stories. But you really get deeper than that. You get to know their story. For example, one of my favorite was Noah Gregson when, when he was on. And it was, it was just before we went to, to Charlotte. And he was down. He's like, man, I just ain't running good. This might be my only chance. Like, this might end my chance. And fortunately, he, he, he's come on since then. He's had some great, strong top five runs, um, including on the road course last week. So hopefully, um, hopefully you'll appreciate these stories and getting to know folks as much as I have. And the NASCAR Monster Energy Cup guys had a weekend off. <laughs> you don't get many of those. And I think this off weekend is positioned perfectly. You know, there's some drivers like Jimmy Johnson, Clint Boyer, that are going to have to make a charge to be in the playoffs in 2019. Two races to go, Darlington and then Indy. Who is going to be the story? We've seen some upset winners at Darlington before. Remember our colleague, Buddy Regan Smith, pulling off that big win. And we've seen the same at Indy. A few years back, Casey Kane was a guy that, Hadn't been close to winning a race, and he went to Indy and grabbed that big prize there. Of course, Indy, we know Paul Menard was an upset winner once. Ryan Newman also would have got, was a guy that won that you wouldn't put at the top of your list. So two exciting races, two great venues, Darlington, Indy. I mean, that says racing there, doesn't it? And these two races are certainly going to be entertaining. It'll be fun to see what driver is able to carry momentum into the playoffs. We know how hot Denny Hamlin is right now after his win at Bristol. But remember what happened last year. Brad Kozlowski won three in a row, including Darlington Indy and then the opening playoff race as well. So it's a great time to get hot. I know those Joe Gibbs racing cars have been hot and maybe the biggest story of 2019. They've won 12 of the first 24 races. Now, if I do my math correctly, that's basically half. That's half of the races Joe Gibbs Racing has won. And what about Stuart Haas Racing? Last year at this point, they had 10 wins. This year, just two. And Clint Boyer is outside the playoffs right now. And he's battling with his teammate that's just inside. We'll certainly find out when we get to Darlington and Indy. And what about Matty D, Matt Benedetto? That run at Bristol was amazing. I think everybody in Tennessee was pulling for Matt. And by the way, did you see that crowd in Tennessee? That crowd was electric, and it was a, such a big night and such a fun night of racing. The product on the track certainly rewarded all those fans that were in the grandstands watching. Matty D got so close, but he's a guy that I'm going to say is going to be on the list to watch this weekend in Darlington. 
To me, Darlington says Matt Benedetto. Got to run right out next to the wall. Got to be aggressive. Got to be tough. And that's exactly what Matt is. So I can't wait to watch the racing as we head toward the playoffs and then see how all this turns out in 2019. Be ready. Green play, green play. Well, as I promised, our guest this week on Wall Trip Unfiltered is Miss Buffy. Buffy is my ex-wife, and I tell people all the time she's the best ex a guy could ever hope for. Uh, we've remained friends and mom and dad of a beautiful little 21-year-old. Buffy, thanks for joining me today. Yeah, it's nice to be here. Thanks for having me. How's your day been? What, do you, what have you been up to? Mama to a 21-year-old, that's got to be pretty easy, right? Yeah, it's fairly easy. It's nice. She's home, as you know, until Monday. Uh, and then I have Sterling, who's four, and keeps everybody on her toes. Yeah, Sterling's four years old and um, just a handsome little dude. How's how's it going with him? You've been uh, running around all day chasing him, I guess? Yes, that and securing child care so I could be here, which is always a challenge in the summer. But we worked it out, and he's at home. I'm sure he's, you know enjoying Macy's friend telling her what to do it has been fun and they actually argue sometimes ah. it's very odd but I'll look over and realize they're actually arguing with each other as if they're you know two years apart instead of 17. <laughs> I hope she wins please tell me she wins. <laughs> Not always. <laughs> <laughs> well I wanted you to come today because we've been talking a lot uh, with some of my guests um, over the last couple of weeks about my um, upcoming documentary, uh, Blink of an Eye, is going to premiere in New York and Los Angeles uh, September 6th, and then it'll be at theaters all across America starting on September 12th. Uh, it's one night only. You can see it on September 12th. I think 800 theaters have um, agreed to, to show it, and so I'm really thankful for the fact that we, we made that, that movie, and it turned out so well. I told uh, anyone that asked me, Buffy, that I cared about really what two people thought about the project, um, you know, when it was over, when it was done, and, and, and was ready to be distributed, um, you know, what their feelings were about the, the the movie. And one was Dale Jr., because obviously he and I were um, really in, deep in that story, obviously, and you. Because you lived it, you saw it. You, 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 you know. I was a race car driver, and you were my my wife and support staff. And I know I had probably tunnel vision. You saw it from um, 360 degrees. Everybody that was involved, and and how that all went down. And uh, you you told me you loved it, and Dell Jr. told me he loved it. So um, that's why I'm proud of the project is because it's authentic, it's real, and it tells a story about a. a a tragic day that that looked to be the perfect day and turned out to be about the worst it could have been um that being said when you watched it what was your takeaway from from the movie well thank you for saying that that was sweet and that means a lot um because it obviously greatly impacted your life and my life forever um my takeaway was uh you know i've i've tried to explain to people if if you came to me with uh, a movie scene or story and said hey I wrote this down to think this would be a great movie uh, I would just read it and think oh my god that's horrible that is that's just unfathomable that uh, this person would uh, work so hard to um, be a professional race car driver um, and have all the challenges that you had and then finally get that golden opportunity um, that vanished in seconds. Um, I mean, you can't, you can't make that up. I don't know why you'd even want to. Um, but I'm really proud of you for writing the book, A, I think or assume that had to be somewhat healing to, to just get some of that out of your head. Um, but then also for the rest of the world to, to know your story because unfortunately life is hard and there's more people that have 
um, a, a lot of challenges in their life, more than people that have the, the perfect Cinderella story. Um, and you and I live that. So I, I think it's a, as bittersweet as it is, um, as painful as it is to watch every single time I've watched it, um, I'm super proud of you for doing it. Um, and, you know, I, I just, I think it's something that people should um, realize that you've been through, that I went through, that Dale Jr. went through. You know, it, it was a very um, impactful event that, like I said, changed, changed everything forever. Yeah. Um, it's funny you say was the writing the book therapeutic because it, um, it, it was for me because, you know, I ignored a lot of things, uh, you know, my mom and dad really well. And their, their philosophy is, um, you'll live, you know, mm -hmm. you fall down, scratch your knee, you'll live, just put a, put a patch on it, uh, whatever, just deal with it. And I, I tried to just sort of forget about most of that, but um, it, it didn't go away. But the most, the coolest thing happened um, two or three months ago. Dale Jr. has a podcast, and he asked me to come be on it. And I swear to you, 18 years later, sitting there talking to Dale Jr., you know how men are, or this one at least, um, pretty much don't talk about anything that matters. We, we sat and talked about that about that day and about what we were thinking and what we were doing and and uh that 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 meant the most and there is you know that meant the most to me to anything just to be able to to hang out with my buddy and and uh and remember the the good times and and the direction we were headed when 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 everything went went bad um so and that's a great example you know for me anyway that this documentary is you know, a must see for people. And it probably took 18 years for both of you to be able to come together under some platform, if the documentary obviously was the platform, um, and have that, that up that time that, you know, without it being too soon or, um, awkward. Um, I don't know. I think that's, that's an example of, of why this documentary is um, so um, just amazing. I think it's it's very important for people, especially race fans, to to see it um, and have a better understanding of of what your life has been like, what Dale Jr.'s life's been like. Um, uh, you know, TV only shows so much. So yeah, and um, the 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 movie the documentary has so many so many m memories that that make me smile and and um the the cool one cool thing that happened we had an industry screening here in Charlotte you 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 attended and and Macy was there my brother Daryl um uh, was was in attendance as well and just a bunch of sponsors and and crew crew members racers and they would come up to to me all of them after watching it and say, you know, I was, I was here. I was in Daytona. I, I've been in the industry these, all this time. I didn't know all that. And, and I think that's the most rewarding part for me is that, you know, people can, people, you know, know that Dale and I are friends, but, but now, now they'll be able to see, you know, how we were friends, why we were friends. And, and, um, I think that's special. Yeah. I've had, very similar experience with that because for one thing you and I we were in my opinion very humble and private about our relationship with Dale and Teresa um, mainly out of respect I think for them because they as popular as he was you know as you know they were a somewhat private couple so um, it never dawned on me how few people really saw the call it the big picture or the whole story um, because so much of our time with them wasn't in everyone's face it wasn't at the racetrack um, 
you know, grilling out together, you know, that was, that was work time for y'all. It, you know, it was away in the Bahamas um, or in New York uh, for the banquet, times like that. And so um, I certainly didn't walk around bragging about those times. I know you didn't. And then when Dale was gone, um, you know, we didn't talk about it then either. It just, um, I just never realized how few people, people that I'm really close to as well, um, not even in racing now, but that just had no idea. And I just assume in, a, in some ways that people kind of knew that story. And I guess they knew a little bit of it. Yeah. They just didn't know the whole piece, you know, which is what is so cool about the documentary. Yeah, um, I my memory of of getting getting uh, the call to so Dell and I would talk all the time when we were fishing or goofing off that you'd win in my car, you know, you drive my car, you'd win, and um, the 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 memory of of Dale looking for me that day in in uh, late August, early September of two thousand when when he he had some news he wanted to share and he couldn't find me. And he called you and looking for me mm-hmm. and just, just, I, I, I remember from that day when he said, you're going to drive for me till the last turn of the last lap of the Daytona 500, uh, life was as good as it ever was, you know, and, and career wise, especially cause I was going to the shop and Dale Earnhardt was going to, was telling me how we we're going to win races. And that, that was a special time. And, do you remember getting that phone call? Oh, yeah. I remember, well, I had just had LASIK eye surgery that day. So my mom was driving. Is that a facelift? Is that what you're talking about? I wish, no. It was <laughs> so I could see. Um, but I just could not believe you had drug your feet on, and I don't even remember now what what rides you had available or what contract you could have potentially already signed with another car owner. Um, but I've, I'll never forget just thinking, this is unbelievable. I, I mean, I don't know that he's ever waited this late in the game to secure employment as a race car driver. And because there really wasn't any reason why we did that. We just, you just didn't feel 100%, you know, good about it. And Thank God you hadn't. I'll just, I'll never forget that part. Just, I just could not believe here we are this late in the season or for the next season. And you were available without any legal stuff. No worries. So that, that was amazing to me. And um, fast forward now, if, if, if you don't mind, to there's a great uh, piece of video in the doc of, of you in your beautiful leather blue, light blue suit, whatever, whatever girls call that, uh, on that pit box. Can you possibly explain to, to the folks listening what those, what those last 20 laps were like oh, for you? Because for me, I was doing just what I was trained to do and knew to do, and I was, I was focused. I didn't, I had no emotion. I just was just focused. And for you, it's a little bit different. It felt very surreal, and it still does whenever I see that scene. Um, Just unimaginable that you were potentially getting ready to win your very first race in Daytona for Dale. Um, It was, it honestly was the best feeling in the world. It, but because it was such a positive feeling and I was so happy for you inside happy for us but especially you um uh, you know it I was also so very 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 nervous as Daytona I mean that's not a track you take for granted you know just because somebody's leading the last you know five laps um anything can happen so but it was it was just an unbelievable feeling. Like I said, when I see it today, when I see that you know clip of me, um, 
I just, uh, it just um, tugs really hard at my heart and my mind as to where my head was at that time. And, you know, it, it honestly, it was in a really good place, especially for you. Like, just, this is a dream come true. This is why, you know, thank you, God. This is, this is why he's went 462 races without a win. This is why we had all these challenges and painful um, weekends at, at racetracks. It, you know, you never know why you're going through those things when you're going through them. Um, and then I just thought for, you know, a very short window of time, <laughs> well, there's our answer. This is, it's, it's all going to be, you know, God groomed us to be prepared for this day. And, and we, I know we won't take it for granted. It, it, it's just going to be an amazing thing if this works out the way it looks like it potentially could. And then it all, it all went south on us, and, uh, and um, it, it, was a, it was a dark time uh, for a while for all of us. But, um, you know, God is good, I say, and, and um, we're all numbers. Our, our, our days on earth are numbered, and it was Dale's turn, and that's, that's how I get up every day and, and move forward, just knowing that my buddy was doing exactly what he wanted to do seeing just what he wanted to see when, when he left the earth, uh, left this world and went, went to, to heaven. And, and that's just what I believe. And that, that helps me deal with it. Yeah. He was definitely in a very good place in his life. Um, very happy, you know, obviously very successful. Um, and, uh, it, it's, it's amazing at the end of the documentary. And I guess I knew this, but, that no driver has been killed in a race since his death. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, that speaks volumes to what what happened after that, for the sport, anyway. Yeah. Well, um, hope people will go watch the documentary. I think um, there's there's many moments in the documentary when when you'll smile and laugh at some of the the stories that that we tell about dale and um uh, you know i have a couple that 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 i think of and and when i'm riding down the road and it'll bring a big smile on my face and most of those um one of those is when we went horseback riding and <laughs> i made it out of the gate and my horse threw me off and <laughs> <laughs> but uh, what, what's one of your favorite uh, Dale memories or stories that makes you smile? Uh, the horse story was pretty, pretty funny. Um, oh gosh, there's so many things. I I think of him a lot, like just little things. Like uh, he taught you and I how to eat caviar. And that's that's weird, right? Do <laughs> drink with super cold vodka. Like we'd never done that before. It's yeah. kind of funny that if you know Dale, um, there was so many. He was such a multifaceted person. Um, if I got my hair cut even a half an inch, he would notice. And um, why'd you just, cut your hair for? Yeah. yeah. Um, I like to tell everybody too when we get on the plane. You sat there. You sat there. You get you get that right. Yeah. And when you're around Dale, you're like. All right, well, I guess. <laughs> I can remember him, um, you know, we were in the Bahamas, and I think they were getting ready to have, like, corporate sponsor-type company or something, and, you know, he was helping Teresa um, drape something properly over a, a coffee, t you know, bench or something. I, it was just... He just was a really amazing person yeah. to be around. Um, I remember him talking about how he could beat you if you had to race up a tree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, that makes me laugh. Well, um, that that one's actually pretty funny because, you know, me, him, and Ty said, we're going to go run. We're going to go running. You want to go, Dale? He said, yeah, I'll go. And so it's like a quarter of a mile from the boat to the road. And there's a little circular driveway, and and we we run out of the the we run onto the road, and we make we make it around that first turn, and Ty and I, uh, Dale 
ran out ahead of us. I mean, he was hauling ass. And Ty and I turned to go toward town like we were going to, and Dale went straight and just ran right straight back to the boat. He might have ran a, a total of a quarter of a mile at the most. And um, we, we went and ran four or five miles and got back. And he's sitting there having a beer. And he said, I don't, I don't, I don't like to run. He said, but, but I could shimmy a tree faster than you if you want to do that. I was like, all right, well, I don't, really, <laughs> I don't really have a reason to climb a tree. But he was very competitive. And, and that reminds me of the story about his mustache. You know, we were going snorkeling to try to get some lobsters and crabs and stuff. And he come up. He went downstairs and come up without his must his famous mustache. Yeah. Came up without it because CJ, um, he said that the the mask wouldn't seal properly and it was leaking and, and he couldn't get down as far as we could and he wasn't gonna give up that advantage. And um Buffy, that's CJ. Say hi to CJ. Hi. Hi, CJ. It's very nice to meet you, Buffy. <laughs> nice finally. to meet you too. Um he has some questions um from Twitter and Reddit. Um that and by the way, if you're if you're a if you're on Twitter, we, we want you to engage with us. We want you to send us your questions, hashtag Ask Mikey, and you can be a part of the show. We'll, we'll uh, read your question and give you credit for, for writing us, and, and you can enjoy the answer to these questions. Let's see what, what uh, CJ's coming off the top rope with. And the first one is from Twitter, and Gary wants to know, Buffy, what would you say is the best and the worst part of being a NASCAR driver wife? Um, I think the best part, um, would be the fact that in that industry, especially as a professional athlete, um, it's very acceptable to travel with your family, um, and it's a very family-oriented sport, and I always really respected that. I always felt very, um, grateful and thankful that, um, you know, we weren't stuck at home three-fourths of the year, and um, so that part was was pretty awesome. Um, you know, Macy got to spend a lot of quality, her younger years before school really became um, super important. You know, the time that she got to spend with her dad um, is so invaluable, and, and most kids don't necessarily get that time with their dad, even if their dad's just, you know, a banker. So that that always stood out to me and still does for the people that are wives now. Um, the worst part is um, watching your husband's performance um, be so public, you know, on the TV, in the newspaper, back then there was newspaper, Twitter, <laughs> uh, social media, um, you know, meaning if, if you didn't have a good day, qualifying or you didn't have a good race finish, um, the whole world knew about it. It was in black and white in your face um, basically until the next weekend. And um, you know, most professional professions, um, we all have bad days and bad performances, uh, but you know, it's not quite so hard to live with in the public eye. So. What else you got, buddy? Uh, the next one's from Reddit, and this is from Rochet29. And they want to know, sitting on top of a pit box exposes you to so many underappreciated dangers, like fire, debris, that sort of thing. What's the biggest holy smokes moment that you have experienced <laughs> on top of the pit box? Luckily, you weren't, you weren't a part of this My World in 1990 when I had that wreck at Bristol. Yeah. Um, well... The main reason I sat on the pit box, um, I learned over the years, is so I could watch the race without interruption. So if you are, you know, in a motorhome, for example, and you've got friends and family, um, you know, they, as, as hard as they might try, they don't really understand that you're trying to listen to every single word on the radio and you're trying to watch every single lap that you can. Um, so that's why I sat on the pit box. Um, and then I really, I'm trying to think, I'm, if there was ever a time where there was like danger in our pits, um, I don't, I don't remember a Maybe. time where I felt unsafe. I will say this, and my daughter gets, rolls her eyes every time I tell her this when she takes friends to the racetrack, but I always tell people, I said, 
The worst time to walk around the pits is after a caution because the gas guys will not slow down for you, pull, you know, pulling those carts. Just be careful. Watch out. Mm -hmm. um, and she's always like, oh, mom. But you could easily get your foot cut off if you were. <laughs> and the, the other end of that is I ran into some crap over the years, and, and Buffy would have to get off the pit box and, and get to the infield, <laughs> infield yeah. care center to make sure I was okay. Yeah, that, that's never a fun trip. Um, what do you, what do you remember about after, um, after the 500 and 01 and how, you know, I just was, I think I was just going through the motions, but when it came time to go back to Daytona in July, um, I, I said, I'm, I'm going to go win this race. They're not stopping me in this race and our return to Daytona in July. What are your memories of that? Um, gosh, it was pretty bittersweet. Uh, to, to go back there, um, but at the same time, I wanted so badly for you to have that win. Um, that might sound selfish because you'd already you'd won the Daytona 500, but um, obviously it felt like it was very deserving. Had you won, you instead you the what happened was magical, you know, awesome, but. Um, you know, I just, during some of that time, it, it, I think we all walked around in a fog. Um, you know, DEI was struggling for leadership. Um, you know, you were, were struggling as to how to go on. And um, I, it was just a pretty crappy time um, until you finished second in, in Daytona. And that didn't fix everything. Um, nothing will ever fix that, but uh, it certainly felt like Dale was shining down on all of us. Smiling at us again. Mm -hmm. Got any more questions you want to read, CJ? Uh, yeah, we had a couple of, uh, a couple of good ones. Uh, this one is from Santa C Fan. These Reddit usernames sometimes are tough to get out, but uh, they would like to know, how did you decide which races to travel to, especially after having children? Uh, I think I pretty much went to all of them. Um, I think that's probably the best decision. That's the one I'd go with too. We yeah. <laughs> we uh we liked it because we st our our house was our motorhome and our motorhome was a couple hundred square feet. So there wasn't any going upstairs for Macy to to you know get on her computer or, or play games. We were pretty much all there all the time, and uh, I, I that's why Buff mentioned earlier about the the family orientation of, of a NASCAR uh, driver or a team and family, just everybody always there. Um, that, that was my, I thought that was really cool that there wasn't no, there wasn't no hiding, you know, if, if, if you had a problem, you better talk about it because you're, you're in a box basically. So that, that's my favorite thing about the, the family life and the bus life at a, at a NASCAR race. Yeah. And I mean, had we stayed married while May, as Macy got older, I think there would have been races that maybe you and I would have decided it, maybe the distance or whatever she had going on in her life um, might have taken precedence. But um, again, I just felt like it was so invaluable and so important to stick together as a family as long as we possibly could um, for all of our sakes. And, you know, I. I feel like it was very um, educational and um, positive, you know, even for Macy. Well, Buff, I really appreciate you coming by and talking about the doc and giving people a little bit of insight into what life was like back then and enjoyed uh, seeing you and chatting with you. And I think that we did a nice job of sort of teeing folks up to say, you know, man, I want to get my tickets to that, to that documentary and go see it um, because there's so much content there. So thank you for sharing. So um, th thank you for um, – I'm new at this. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for yeah, right. shining some light onto, um, you know, what, what was a bit of a, a dark subject, but, but it's life and life's hard and, and – um, and, um, we're all 
we're all here and, and looking forward to, to seeing what's next. That's right. And if you like documentaries, you're, you're not going to find a better documentary to go see, for sure, even if you're not a race fan. That's what I would say is, and I love documentaries, but the storyline itself is um, pretty crazy. Um, it's pretty painful for those of us that lived it, but definitely well worth a, a ticket to the theater. <laughs> I tell everybody all the time, it's a damn good story if, if you weren't me or Dale Jr. or Buffy or... Yeah. Pretty wild. Yeah. Thank you, dear. Yes, you're welcome. Well, thank you so much for listening to another edition of Wall Trip Unfiltered. Remember, you can go to blinkofaneyefilm.com to buy your tickets to the documentary. I'm sure there's a theater near you that's going to be playing it on September 12th. Thank you to Miss Buffy for coming by and sharing some stories uh, that you will be able to see in the documentary. And just appreciate everybody tuning in and listening. Be sure to tell your friends that they can subscribe via their favorite podcast app. I had to tell Buffy that. She's like, where do I listen to this app? And I think I get that a lot of the times. People don't, don't know where this lives. But um, we're on your favorite podcast app. You can also watch us on Fox Sports YouTube channel, some of these video clips. And if you're on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Reddit, wherever you are, Ask Mikey is our hashtag. You can ask Mikey a question and I'll read your name and answer your question. We'd love to have your support. Love to have you chime in and help us ask these great guests that we have week in and week out a question. Again, thank you so much for listening and I'll talk to you next week.